Hello and welcome to this show. I am Dr. Chris Martinson here with another episode for you today, episode 79. You are the curious, the remnant, the people who are interested in knowing what's going on. Boy, have I got a great episode for you today. Lots going on in the world, but I thought it's time for a little fundamental. Let's back up, let's take a look, let's answer this question. How safe is your money in a bank? Now, I just had a conversation this weekend with somebody who was under a lot of false misapprehensions about really how banking works and all of that, because you might have this idea that, well, you have money and it's yours and it's in a bank. That's actually not how it works at all. So we've got to cover that today because there's so much going on in the world that actually says maybe it's time to take a few chips off the table, if you know what I mean, and uh, make things a little bit safer for ourselves. All right, let's go there. Why would you take cash out of the bank? I'm going to recommend you take cash out of the bank, and this episode explains why you should do that and um, reasons. Hey, you're going to Las Vegas, right? You're going to go out there and uh, have a fabulous good time in fabulous Las Vegas. Maybe, I don't know, I mean, you're going on Craigslist, and the guy will not sell you his Cat 305 uh, for anything other than cash. That could be, or it could be because you realize that you are an unsecured creditor of the bank when you put money into a bank account. What? What? <laughs> What does that mean? That doesn't sound good. Okay, an unsecured creditor, let's go there. This is in Forbes magazine. This was just written in June of 2022, so it's recent. Um, and you know, Forbes facts checks their, their articles, so in case you need it to come from someplace official like Forbes, but this is all fact checked. Everything I'm gonna tell you as always sourced, researched, and as accurate as I can make it. Now, this article written here by Arufus Kamau talking really about Bitcoin, but outlining some of the reasons why some people have decided to take money out of the banking system. He writes here, quote, a cash deposit in a bank is virtually an unsecured loan to the bank with no assurance that your money is safe and easily accessible. To make it worse, the bank determines the terms and conditions for such a loan, end quote. Sound shocking? Well, it's actually true. This is how the whole system is structured. You don't know that, but if you ever go down there and you read carefully that all those sheafs of documents you have to go through to open a bank account, you'll find out that it's all spelled out in there and including the idea that the terms and conditions can change at any moment in time, subject to other things that are not even in the documents you would sign when you open that bank account, including all sorts of other regulatory provisions that have gotten slapped on there. We're gonna be talking about one of the most onerous changes to the whole banking code that happened in response to the great financial crisis in 2008, which is the odious, completely, I think, well-intentioned, but of course, malignantly deformed by lobbyists by the time it came out of the sausage grinder maker we called Washington, D.C., and I'm talking about the Dodd-Frank Act. We'll get there in just a second. But first, uh, quoting in green at the bottom, when you deposit money in a bank, you surrender legal title to the cash and it becomes the bank's asset. Hmm. As a result, you become an unsecured creditor to the bank. That is, the bank doesn't give you any security as protection in case it defaults. Actually, I'm gonna take exception with that. It's really the bank's liability. The bank has a liability, but the way they structure it, that liability is so far down the chain of things that they would have to attend to if they got in trouble, that really you're very close to last in line subject only to whatever protections you would get from the FDIC here in the United States or other protections in other countries. We'll talk about some of those. This is really important. So when you make that bank deposit, you take a big old fat stack of cash, you put it in the bank, there are many other secured creditors in line if that institution goes into a bankruptcy or an insolvency proceeding. There are many, many, many. And then finally, there's you down at the bottom in every other unsecured creditor, last in line, for whatever dribs may be left of that ruined institution. So here's how it works out. Unsecured creditors, well, you get the leftovers. Here's the formula. Distribution would be on the top of this little equation right here. You have total assets of the bank or the institution that's failed. It has a bunch of assets, right? It's got mortgages that, that have some value to them. It's got loans that have some value to them, but it has a lot of liabilities. But first you take those total assets and you subtract from those secured claims. So these are claims that come higher in the hierarchy of, of the indebtedness provisions, sorry, the um, bankruptcy provisions. So there's a different seniority to these things. Some people get paid first. The unsecured creditors get paid last. So first they take out the secured claims, 
They also take out the priority unsecured claims, whatever, if there's a big fat zero at the top of that or a negative number, oops, unsecured claims get a zero. And then you have to divide that by the totality, the total of unsecured claims. That would be every depositor in the bank. That would include other people who've got outstanding bills with the bank. Like maybe they, I don't know, redid the floors in a bank building and you know they, they didn't have that as a secured sort of a, a note against them. And um, then you multiply that by your particular unsecured claim, fractional percent, and that's what you get. So, so what, what total assets, what are secured claims? What are priority unsecured claims? Oh my God, this sounds more complicated. I have cash in the bank, I want it back. Uh, that's not how it works, so you need to know that. Okay, so here in Investopedia, so this is pretty centrist, but they did a really good job explaining, I think, the difference between what are, is now called a bank bail-in versus a bank bail-out. Now, a bailout, we're all familiar with that because that's whatever happened all the way up through and including 2009. Remember when like these big banks got in trouble and hundreds of billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, were thrown at the banks to keep them solvent so they could continue operating. And then that created a bit of a hue and cry. So the banking laws were completely rewritten into this giant monstrosity called the Dodd-Frank Act. I think it's like 893 pages or something. It's like this giant book. And it explains a lot of things, but what it did was it completely recast who is supposed to take the losses when a big institution like a bank gets into trouble. So here's what they say here. Bail-ins and bailouts, quoting now, both serve the same purpose. They are designed to prevent the complete collapse of a failing bank. Uh, you know what? That's a good intention. But the difference between the two lies primarily in who bears the financial burden of rescuing the bank. Now, this isn't necessarily bad. This could be a good thing because you actually want the people who took the risks to be the ones bearing the losses. So they tried to do that, but then the whole thing got taken apart by lobbyists, as we'll see. With bailouts, the government injects capital into banks, enabling them to continue their operations. During the financial crisis, the government bailed out major banks by injecting $700 billion into names like Bank of America, Citigroup, and American International Group. Since the government doesn't have its own money, it must use taxpayer funds, end quote. Now, the annoying part about all this was that very next year, those same big banks gave themselves and all their top employees record bonuses. Because guess what? It was immensely profitable to be given free taxpayer cash. Who knew, right? So that was the scam. That was the game. It was really embarrassing. I think, you know, the intention of Dodd-Frank was to try and make this a little more fair and put the onus back on the banks a little bit and, and, and they tried. So carrying on in yellow, quote, bail-ins work a little differently, providing immediate relief. Banks use money from their unsecured creditors, including depositors and bondholders to restructure their capital to stay afloat. In other words, they take money out of this pocket and put it back into this pocket because this pocket's out of money. So there's some cash over here but it's inside the bank, so they bail in. A bailout is a bailout coming from the outside of the bank. A bail-in is, what's inside the bank? Hey, some of your money's in there. Now, with some wrinkles around FDIC limits, we'll talk about that in just a second. In green, quote, put simply, they can convert their debt into equity to increase their capital requirements. Although depositors run the risk of losing some of their deposits, banks can only use deposits in excess of the $250,000 protection provided by the FDIC. We're going to go into this. This is actually really important for your, for my U.S. listeners here. You have to find out in your own country what the rules are because everybody's got their own. In the EU, I believe that the limit is up to 100,000 euros is protected um, through some sort of insurance scheme, but above 100,000 euros in an account. Now, that would be subject the bail ins. Now, here's where it gets a little bit extra dicey for me. Um, so what? Carrying on in that same Investopedia article, unsecured creditors, depositors, and bondholders, unsecured creditors, yeah, that's you, depositors, and bondholders all fall below derivative claims. Whoops. Derivatives are investments that banks make among each other, which are supposed to be used to hedge their portfolios. However, the 25 largest banks hold more than $247 trillion in derivatives, which pose a tremendous amount of risk to the financial system. 
To avoid a potential calamity, the Dodd-Frank Act gives preference to derivative claims. End quote. Now, the reason this is important, I just talked about in a recent episode about how the GILT market, G-I-L-T, not the G-U-I-L-T, that's a different market. In the UK, the GILT market is their bond market, it's their equivalent of the US Treasury market. It went into a derivative-fueled meltdown, meaning the yields melted up, the bond prices melted down. Those derivative exposures would have been the kinds of things we're talking about. And it's a guarantee that there were some very big financial institutions and probably banks all tied up in that. So the central bank felt they had to step in and rescue that because if this monster melts down, Armageddon, right? It it's, could be pretty bad. Nobody really knows. So the guys, the idea is, let's not have that happen. All right. So important point, unsecured creditors. Those of us with bank money in there below the FDIC limit or above the FDIC limit or above the EU 100,000 euro limit, they, their claims are unsecured and they fall below in seniority. Derivatives get paid first. And then after a whole bunch of other things, actually people who have money in the bank gets held there. Now, even if it is FDIC insured, we have to tell you that the process by which a, a company, a bank goes into insolvency and goes through a restructuring, it's not necessarily quick. It's not like, well, I have FDIC insurance up to 250. I can just get that instantly. Mm, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the FDIC has to take receivership of that failing bank and then has to spend time trying to figure out what it has, what it doesn't have, how big are the derivative portfolios? What are they worth? Nobody really actually knows. How do you mark this stuff to market? Nobody has a clue. It just takes time. So even the idea that it's FDIC insured, I would not be counting on if I was you or anybody, including myself, that that would be restructured rapidly or quickly so that if this thing fails and it fails on a weekend, it's open by Monday and we all just keep moving. Bad assumption. Maybe, but more realistically, probably not. All right. So the derivatives are those things up there, total assets of the bank minus the secured claims. That's what we're talking about. Or maybe priority on secured claims, depending on where they stuff them. But for sure, the derivatives get removed first. So if the bank had a lot of failing derivative positions, which by the way, might've been a good reason for it to have failed in the first place, all its capital gets wiped out. All of the bonds, you know, holders, their bonds, that debt gets converted into equity, meaning, hey, bondholder, you don't have a million dollars of Citibank bonds anymore. You have a million dollars of shiny new Citibank equity. You own stock in the company, but that million dollars that we thought we owed you is now over here and belongs to us as, um, as cash that we can use. All right. Hey, Canada happens there too. This is uh, the CDIC up in Canada. They describe how a bail-in works up in Canada. Same stuff. They talk about what happens in a failure. The rationale they provided, I think is really good. So, so the intention was good. The execution got a little muddied with that whole derivative thing that they snuck in there. Uh, quoting here from the C CDIC in Canada, the 2008 global financial crisis highlighted that some banks are systemically important. That is, they are so important to the functioning of the financial system and economy that they cannot be wound down under a conventional bankruptcy and liquidation process without imposing unacceptable costs on the economy. These are your too big to fail institutions. Now, who decides what's an unacceptable cost? Honestly, editorially, in 2009, if we'd lost a couple of major banks in the United States because they did some really dumb stuff, right? If Citi was completely out of business, AIG, fine. You know what? Let the people who were involved in that lick their wounds. Please don't put your capital in risky companies again. And I think we would have a better functioning system. Nobody learned their lesson from the bailouts. I don't think they're going to learn their lessons any better from the bail-ins. What you have to do is you have to allow absolutely corrupt, venal, poorly run, whatever the story is, companies and banks in particular, you got to let some of them fail. Even if it's painful, you got to let that happen so that the other ones don't do really dumb, risky stuff. Now, faced with inadequate tools to deal with failed global banks, authorities and other jurisdictions were forced to rely on taxpayer funded capital injections to support these banks in the interests of broader financial and economic stability. These are commonly referred to as bailouts. So other jurisdictions, Canada's here referring to the US and Europe. But what it really boils down to is privatized gains and socialized losses. They were trying to find a way to stop that because bailouts, the banks would just do all these risky things and then they would make all this money. So that was privatized gains. But then, oops, got in trouble. 
taxpayers had to bail them out so they would socialize the losses. It's a very, very unfair system. Completely unfair, obviously. So, quote, in addition to the direct cost to the taxpayer associated with these bailouts, the expectation of a bailout, if the bank were to fail, gives the bank's managers an incentive to take on excessive risk as they would receive all the potential benefits but bear only some of the potential costs. The expectation of a bailout also allows domestic systemically important banks, DSIBs, to borrow on more favorable terms as creditors view the bank debt as implicitly guaranteed by taxpayers. By contrast, small and medium-sized banks do not benefit from this implicit subsidy in the form of lower funding costs, as there is less of an expectation that they would be bailed out should they fail. End quote. So that's what they're trying to correct for. There was some structural unfairness within the banking system itself, large to small, large having more of an advantage because the large were deemed by investors to be too large to fail, which indeed was how they were viewed. So they got better funding costs. Listen, um, this is where it all kind of broke off off the rails, though. Um, In contrast to a bailout, and this again is in the CDIC up in Canada, in contrast to a bailout, a bail-in is intended to rescue a failing bank by making its creditors and shareholders bear the cost of recapitalizing the bank, (coughs) excuse me, through conversion of some or all of the bank's bail-in debt into common shares. So they're going to take some of the debt. It's just a debt to equity swap. Really hurts if you held debt. Now you have shares in a bailing institution. That sucks. Um, at any rate, uh, that was that was the plan. Now, what happened? Well, you know how what happened. This big dreams, but then um, people got a hold of it and, and turned it into lobbyists got a hold of it. So this is how it usually works. Uh, very handy graphic here from the CDIC. Bank up top. We start with business as usual. It's open. Nobody seems nervous. There's, hey, maybe some heightened risk coming from some quarter. Then at some point, it's recognized that there's a point of non-viability for that institution. And then there's a resolution weekend. Whoops, that's why somebody asked me recently, why do these banks always fail on the weekend? Listen, they were failing for a month prior, but they pick a weekend because they want to be able to close this on a Friday night, sort of making everything look normal. But then, surprise, uh, there is a, a weekend where they go, oh yeah, this bank totally failed. And... Then there's that next box, which is stabilization slash restructuring. That could take a while, depending on how complicated and how how deep the deficits are for that particular bank. And then there's some sort of an exit, right? But that bail-in is happening during that resolution weekend uh, restructuring period. So that's how it works. That's why you need to understand that nobody's going to give you any warning, except the warning I gave last week, and lots of people saw these warnings, where you see the stock price of Credit Suisse just tanking along, right? That's your warning sign that something's not right at Credit Suisse, something's not right at Deutsche Bank, something's not right at PNB Paribas, right? You can see it in the stock price many months before. Most people won't. They'll just wake up one day, Saturday, like, why is my bank closed? Uh, And how long is it gonna stay closed? Hey, it's in this restructuring process. So that's how it works, okay. So the surprise weekend comes along. Now, thanks, Dodd-Frank. Oh my God. Uh, Here's a nice article that talks about this. This is in the Epoch Times, how Dodd-Frank made it legal for banks to confiscate funds during a banking crisis. Quote, sadly, Dodd-Frank has set the whole thing up so that um, derivatives, highly leveraged assets, take precedence over your deposit accounts when it comes to paying off their debts. Counterparties to these derivatives get first dibs. Customer deposits are secondary, actually they're tertiary. Sure, the FDIC may attempt to come to your rescue. The problem is that the FDIC's total assets, which are in the billions, are dwarfed by the value of outstanding derivatives, which are in the trillions. Maybe we should take a look at that. Let's take a closer look at that. Let's just check in. Let's go over to the OCC, the Office of Comptroller at uh, .gov there. Let's pull up the most recent quarterly report on bank trading and derivatives. Let's pull up that one from September 13th of 2022 and pull it up and Let's see, notional amounts of all derivative contracts in billions of dollars. Oh yeah, 200,354 billions. A uh, thousand billion is what we colloquially call a trillion. So yeah, about 200 trillion. Now this is notional derivatives. What That doesn't mean that they owe 200,000, they can't pay 200,000 billion or 200 trillion. If this derivative 
has is made is for a trillion dollars and it's made with this party over here, they could both net out to zero. The notional amount would be the trillion dollars on the books, but the actual amount, the net value of that would be zero. But the point here is, is that how much would that notional amount have to wobble away from even Steven, where everybody's risk their hedge their bets and hedge their risk appropriately, so it nets out to zero. How much would it have to wobble to eat up all of that FDIC funding? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, only two hundred trillion though. This is fine. Um, some math. So the FDIC has one hundred twenty four billion in its deposit insurance fund, the DIF. And when we divide that by 200,000 billion, which is 200 trillion, we find that that 200,000 billion would only have to wobble by about 0.07% to completely chew through that particular FDIC amount up there. So listen, if the derivative market blows, if it really goes asymmetric, now there's going to be winners and losers, and maybe they just unwind the bets at some point in time. But it's, it's so complicated and there's so many pieces to this. A derivative isn't a thing like a share of Apple stock that you buy, right? You just buy it, you own a share of Apple. It's pretty defined what you got. A derivative is a contract. You and I might write a derivative with each other. We might write a derivative that says, hey, we're going to place a bet with each other on the rate of interest in January of 2025. And if it's a little higher than this number, you owe me money. If it's lower than this number, I owe you money. But we're also going to hinge it to the temperature. And we have a side bet with somebody else that if the temperature in January is like above 30 degrees, you owe me 2x. Unless it's below 30, then I owe you 2x. But that temperature is now hedged off by this other person. It just goes like that. It's very, very complicated how these things are written. So to, to untangle them, again, restructuring could take a while. All right. Um, so FDIC, though, here in the United States, people like to think and comfort ourselves with the idea that we are FDIC insured if you are in an FDIC insured depository institution. Not all of them are, right? So, you know, check and see. Sometimes the banks have the little FDIC logo. Sometimes they don't. And if they don't, they're usually insured through other means. I'm not talking about those banks, just FDIC insured banks. This is from the FDIC's website. Website, it says here, the standard deposit insurance amount is $250,000 per depositor Per insured bank, I have to confess something here. I have not looked at these rules in a little while, so I've probably been saying wrong information for at least a year because it used to be per insured bank account. They've changed this. They've whittled it down a little bit. So it's not per account anymore. It's now per insured bank. So I gotta be, I'm gonna be more careful. At least now I've updated this. I understand what's going on again. Quote, the FDIC insures deposits that a person holds in one insured bank separately from any deposits the person owns in another separately chartered insured bank. So if you have accounts in two separate banks, you're cool. But if it's all structured in one bank, you only have up to that one limit. For example, if a person has a certificate of deposit in bank A and has a CD at bank B, the amounts would each be insured separately up to $250,000. Funds deposited in separate branches of the same uh, bank are of the same insured bank are not separately insured. Got it? So now they've now here they have some. Hey, they gave they gave a, an example here. Mary Jones here has a variety of accounts all at a single at a single bank. Uh, got an MMDA, got a savings account, a CD, has a checking account that's in our sole proprietorship. So that's a business account. You see all the account balances. Those account balances add up to $260,000 for Mary in total, but the insured amount is only two fifty, dollars leaving $10,000 off the table. That would be part of the bail-in. That would be subject to the bail-in, that last $10,000 here under this scheme. And it's all very complicated. Or if it's a joint account and this and that and you know on and on. Um, the point here is that if you have more than $250,000 in an account, it's at risk. If you have more than $250,000 spread across accounts within a single bank type, single bank entity, that's at risk. That's what I'm updating here um, that I didn't know because that wasn't, it didn't used to be that way. That has changed. Now, looking at the FDIC, they have this deposit insurance fund and they say the fund is now funded at 1.26% of insured bank deposit accounts. So when we multi divide, do a little fancy multiplicate division of, um, 124.5 billion by 
1.26%, we find out that there's $124 billion in the kitty at the FDIC that's being held against $9.98 trillion of deposits. So 1.26% of all deposits out there are actually insured. They figure that's a good coverage ratio. They actually are shooting for 2%. They're not quite there. But even 2% means that they're only looking at a 1 in 50 recovery rate if all the banks um, went went down. So it's not a huge amount, but they say that's that's reasonable to them. I think it probably is reasonable. It, it, this The FDIC to me would be insurance that's absolutely perfectly fine unless you need it. 1.26% is not going to be sufficient to actually cover this. In a, it would be more complicated. I could peel out the FDIC's balance sheet for you and show you that they actually, a lot of that money that they're holding in that deposit insurance fund is not cash. They've got it invested in real estate. They've got it in equities. They've got it in bonds. They've got it in the same kinds of products you could imagine would be get in trouble if a bank got in trouble. So it's kind of a, a weird system, but that's how it works. So at any rate, um, Investopedia at the end of that whole bail-in article had some good suggestions. So this is what to do. What's the official version what can you officially say if you're a responsible financial media site? What would you do? If you want to protect your assets, a few tips they say here. One, keep a watchful eye on the performance of the financial markets in the financial sector. Absolutely. And if you see your bank tanking, you might want to take some evasive action there. And again, I personally am not comforted by the FDIC insurance here in the United States, even though it may protect me because of the idea it might protect me, but my money still might get locked or frozen inside of an, a banking entity for a long time while they figure out what the restructuring actually is and all of that. Two, they say, ensure the financial institutions you choose are financially secure and stable. We'll be talking about that back at my website a little bit because there's ways to actually pick that. Three, you want to spread the risk by diversifying your money and assets across different banks and countries. This is interesting for Investopedia to be saying this. You want to keep your balances at or below the $250,000 limit here in the U.S., absolutely. Next, make sure you monitor any changes to federal government policies about, the, oh, God, we have to monitor what the... So the Frank Dodd Act was really there to, to replace the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act is 33 pages. Frank Dodd is 893 pages. It's just like, oh, my God. No, even even professional tax accountants can't keep track of that stuff. It's a, it's, it's a mess. So this suggestion here that you want to monitor changes to federal government policies of bank, de bank deposits, but maybe you do. I, sir, I certainly, I'm chagrined to have discovered that the FDIC quietly changed its per account rule to per bank. They snuck that one on me. So it's a good, it's a good suggestion, but what, what a chore that we even have to be in the business of trying to monitor changes to federal government policies. Oh, good God. That's, that's not good. Finally, don't bank with any institution that has large derivative and mortgage books, which can't be risky in times of crisis. Uh, that's a volatile statement right there if we were going to name names, because um, th these would be all the biggest of the big. If you went to that OCC report, pull it down, they actually name the names. You can find out who the largest derivative holders are. They are all the biggest of the big banks. They hold trillions. Some, some of these big banks actually hold derivative portfolios that are larger than the entire world GDP. Again, notional amounts. Maybe they all balance out, but um, good advice there. Now, that's the official version. What do we do at Peak Prosperity? Hey, we have the, we have the peaky version, peaky blinder version. What do we do? Just like the mobsters of old and maybe today, cash. We love cash. Cash is your money out of the banking system as long as you have somewhere safe to hold it. Big fan of having cash outside of the banking system. Second, I'm a big fan of gold and silver. I think these are wonderful ways to hold some of your financial wealth outside of the financial system. And by the way, gold is the only monetary asset that I know about that is not simultaneously somebody else's liability. Every other piece of paper, including those pieces of paper over there on the, on the side, those are actually the liability of the Federal Reserve. It says so right on it. Um, so your asset, somebody else's liability. That's how the whole banking system works, except for gold. It has this weird quality. It's just your asset, and there's nobody on the other side. If they fail to perform, something bad happens to your gold. All right. Next, I'm a huge fan of productive farmland. Land, you know, Any productive land is a great way to 
make sure that you have some money out of the banking system. Now, does that sound crazy? Well, it's as crazy as Bill Gates. I mean, obviously, the wealthy have already been scooping up land like crazy. So by the time that sort of filters down as an okay thing to do at the retail family circle that we all inhabit, it's too late, right? The, the best land's already been bought up and all of that. I'm a huge fan. If you can, you want to hold farmland for all sorts of reasons, including for your own private personal use somewhere down the road. And of course, forest land, um, big fan of, this is hardwood forest in particular, big fan of hardwood, particularly because it, it represents a means of heating, which in Europe is now actually an extraordinary thing what's happening over there with the price of wood in um, Europe. I just found out that in Denmark, a cord of wood is selling for almost $2,000 US right now. A cord, it's astonishing. They're facing firewood thefts. Bloomberg just had a big article about that. Um, all right, so that's what I have on the banking system. Please, please, please understand the banking system and where you're at. This is what we're gonna be talking about in part two. Things are getting hot. We're going to be talking about what just happened in the banking system that I'm looking at right now, as well as what's going on over there in uh, Europe around all of that. So if you want to hear more about this and figure out, you know, a little bit more about what to do, come on by Peak Prosperity. This is for members only, this part two, as usual. So we're going to be just talking about all kinds of things. And I can get to, I get to take my gloves off a little bit more because as you know, we've been facing censorship out here in the big wide world of big tech, which doesn't really like us talking about things that have free thought, free inquiry, curiosity, and the ability to decide for ourselves. Fiction from truth, they hate that. They'd rather be in support of giving us the official narratives, which turn out to be in their favor and not yours, almost invariably. That's it, that's what I have for you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, share this, hit the subscribe button if you need to or want to, and like this if you can, please. That helps the algorithm serve it to more people. <clears throat> and I think more people deserve to hear this. Until next time, signing off, Chris Martinson here. We'll see you next time. Bye.